So, hello friends. So, I'll just give a brief overview on uh, this clinical condition, Hashimoto's encephalopathy. Uh, so, we have been increasingly noticing these cases coming to ICU with encephalopathy. And it's important for all the trainees to recognize this condition, have a high index of suspicion to do diagnostic tests to establish this diagnosis and appropriately manage. Uh, so, I wish to acknowledge my colleague, Dr. Pratibha, who helped me develop this content. So, it's a very brief overview for all the clinicians to have a bit of a clarity on this uh, encephalopathy. So, when we talk about uh, Hashimoto's encephalopathy, as the name suggests, so the patients come with altered sensorium and they can come with seizures. So, there is a typical sort of a triad they come with. So, they come with uh, cognitive impairment, neuropsychiatric manifestations and seizures. So, these are the three typical characteristics that one should see. So, altered sensorium and seizure becomes an important aspect of this uh, Hashimoto's encephalopathy. And they will have neuropsychiatric manifestations. Uh, so, they typically can have any sort of a you know, psychiatric issues, hallucinations, delusions, or uh, behavioral changes, so on and so forth. So, along with this, so the, the neurological manifestations, encephalopathy with seizures, the other important aspect that uh, should fulfill to call it as Hashimoto's is they should have antibodies against, they should be anti-thyroid antibodies. Uh, so, anti-TPO uh, against thyroid peroxidase is what antibodies they should have. So, the, so together constitutes uh, Hashimoto's encephalopathy. And uh, this uh, Hashimoto's was first reported and recognized by Lord Walter Russell Brain in 1966. So, he described this case in a 49-year-old gentleman. So, that was when it was first recognized as a distinct entity, Hashimoto's uh, uh, encephalopathy. So, when you talk about epidemiology, it is a rare condition. It is not a very common condition. So, one should have clarity and index of suspicion in a given clinical situation in someone with thyroid disorder. So, the prevalence of Hashimoto's encephalopathy is 2 per 1 lakh. So, that's the sort of occurrence rate. And it's more common in females. So, when you look at female to male ratio, it is four to five times more commoner in females mm -hmm. as opposed to male. Although the first report was in male patient in 1966. So, the mean age of occurrence is 41 to 48 years. So, it occurs in younger age group. So, any uh, female patient coming to ICU in this age group with encephalopathy, with a thyroid problem, one should raise this suspicion of Hashimoto's encephalopathy. As I said, for the clinical features, one should look at three important dimensions. So, the first one is the seizure. So, that is the one aspect. And there will be cognitive disorder. So, there will be cognitive dysfunction. And the third aspect is neuropsychiatric. So, these are the three important components of encephalopathy. And two-thirds of the Hashimoto's encephalopathy will have seizures. And the seizures will be in a relapsing in nature and remitting and relapsing in nature. And it can be any types of seizures. So, it can be focal seizures, generalized seizures, or it can be even status epilepticus, or it can present with myoclonus, or it can only present with tremors, or it can present with non-convulsive status epilepticus. So, it can be any dimension of the seizures forms an important component of Hashimoto's with cognitive disorder along with neuropsychiatric manifestations. So, pathophysiology, the interesting aspect for all my ICU trainees, I say, is when you look into deeply into pathophysiology of any organ, it is all going into a lot of cytokine sort of a, uh, activity that happens around the nerves. And pretty much they say the mechanism is not very clearly known. And the encephalopathy is attributed to some sort of a vasculitis. So, there is vasculitis component within the brain. And there is a lot of inflammatory component in the brain. So, I'm sure for all our ICU trainees, for any pathophysiologically, now if you dwell into it, it, it boils down to inflammatory changes at the vascular level and at the tissue levels. And that's what happens in uh, Hashimoto's as well. And what they have recognized is there's a lot of antibodies. So, there is some sort of a cytokine storm, as you see, a lot of antibodies against the different neurons within the brain. So, that is the quintessence of the pathophysiology and there is a lot of immune complex deposition also that tends to happen at the neuronal level. So, that pretty much is what is known about Hashimoto's. There is a low-grade sort of a vasculitis happening at the neuronal level, a lot of immune complex de deposition, 
and there is some sort of lot of antibody production at the neuronal level and inflammatory changes. And like any other pathophysiological, take sepsis, take dengue, the problem lies at the endothelial structure. So there is a lot of inflammation at the endothelial cells in the brain. So, and you take sepsis, there is endothelial dysfunction and there is sort of a, uh, a disruption that happens. There's a lot of uh, endothelial barrier that gets disrupted in dengue. So is the case in uh, this Hashimoto's. So any pathologic condition you take in the ICU, I think the problem lies at the endothelial dysfunction that tends to happen. Uh, so this is the this is what is known with regards to pathophysiological findings in Hashimoto's. There is low-grade vasculitis, inflammation at the endothelial level, and cytokine production, a lot of antibodies against the neurons with immune complex deposition. So there is a whole sort of a question raised whether this encephalopathy can be labeled it as a distinct entity. And this question was raised in 2003, whether it's a syndrome or a myth by Chong at all. But uh, they did sort of a agree upon that it is a distinct sort of a pathophysiological condition where there is there should be a combination of encephalopathy with anti-thyroid antibodies. And the third component that they put in place to diagnose Hashimoto's, they should be they should respond to steroids. Their encephalopathy should get better by initiating them on steroids. So these three components should be present to call someone as Hashimoto's encephalopathy. So they should have antibodies, they should have encephalopathy, and they should start getting better after you start them on steroids. Uh, but the whole question is, this anti-thyroid antibodies, how much role do they have in the whole pathogenesis or pathophysiological aspect of Hashimoto's is still being debated and questioned. And they, there is even a contemplation that it is probably a marker of other autoimmune diseases. Because there are a lot of antibodies against thyroid, but they are not able to correlate whether these antibodies are solely responsible for causing this encephalopathy. And direct correlation of these antibodies to encephalopathy is being debated and questioned. And there are other sort of a synonyms or other names for this Hashimoto's. So they called it as steroid responsive encephalopathy uh, with antithyroid sort of a antibodies that are present. Uh, so that CREATE is one name. And there is non-vasculitis autoimmune meningoencephalopathy. These are the two different names. So steroid responsive encephalopathy uh, with antithyroid. And then there is non-vasculitis autoimmune meningoencephalopathy. These are the two different names for this Hashimoto's encephalopathy. So when we talk about diagnostic criteria, as I said, they should have three components. They should have seizures, they should have cognitive disorder, then they should have neuropsychiatric disturbance with antithyroid antibodies, and they should be steroid responsive. So the criteria are similar. So in diagnostic, they should have high levels, serum levels of antithyroid antibodies against thyroid peroxidase should be high. So the simplistic way is any patient with a thyroid problem with encephalopathy, you can do this anti-TPO, which we are routinely doing in our ICU. If the titus are more than 500, it should be indicative or send out a signal that it could possibly be Hashimoto's encephalopathy. Or you could do cerebrospinal fluid, CSF, oligoclonal bands. So that is also one of the markers. And the second important criteria is they should be responsive to steroids. When you give steroids, encephalopathy should get better. There should not be structural abnormality in the brain. So MRI should be normal. So that is also one criteria. And it's a diagnosis of exclusion. One should have excluded other causes of encephalopathy. It could be hyponatremia or any neuro infection or a stroke, lacunar infarct. All those other causes has to be ruled out. And, there, and differential diagnosis like even OSA and other. So it's a diagnosis of exclusion. Other possible confounding factors have to be ruled out. And EEG also has to corroborate with the encephalopathy. So these are the sort of a diagnostic criteria one should. So the key aspect for you to remember is do the TPO antibodies. The antibodies are high, steroid responsive, and there is no structural problem in the brain. Pretty much should tell you that possibly we are looking at Hashimoto's encephalopathy. So when we talk about treatment, so steroids are the mainstay of the treatment. So obviously when you look into the literature, there are no clear guidelines with regards to how much steroids one should give and for how long one should give. There are no clear guidelines. So with regards to dose and duration, but the common dose one has given is 1 to 2 mg per kg or 50 to 150 milligram per day is what has been given in multiple. And most of these literature references 
for the literature comes from all the case series. So 50 to 150 mg per day has been used in most of the case series, or you can remember as one to two mg per kg of steroid. And pulse therapy has also been uh, found to be useful in cases where patients have not responded to the conventional dose of steroids. Again, there is no robust evidence and all this comes from case series. So there's no big randomized control trial to say that pulse is better than the normal steroid. So there's no hard data to tell us, but pulse therapy has used as a desperate measure when things have not improved with the conventional dose steroids. And improvement, unfortunately, tends to happen slowly. They don't have dramatic improvement. So improvement takes weeks to months. And azathioprine and cyclophosphamide, other immunosuppressive agents have also been used as a measure to uh, sort of uh, treat this uh, Hashimoto's encephalopathy. And IVIG also has used as a desperate measure. So these are all the different modalities. But as I said, there's no clear sort of a algorithm or a, a guidelines which suggest when all this second line or third line agent should be used. And most of them have been determined by the clinical expertise. So IVIG and immunosuppressive, like any other autoimmune conditions, have been used. And the, the key differential diagnosis one should contemplate when you're dealing with Hashimoto's encephalopathy is to look at other autoimmune encephalopathy because there is a sort of an overlap or a close sort of a similarities between autoimmune encephalitis because it is an autoimmune encephalitis in the setting of antithyroid antibodies. So one has to look for other causes of autoimmune encephalitis and one should work up for other autoimmune encephalitis that may be prevailing. And one should look at paraneoplastic as a underlying etiology. So possibly the patients may need to be looked at for any onco CT to look for any underlying occult lymphomas or malignancies, so on and so forth. So these are the two important differentials one has to look for when you are labeling someone as Hashimoto's encephalopathy. So prognosis, this becomes very important. Prognosis is surprisingly good. And neurological recovery happens in 93% of the cases in three months. And this comes from this again case series from Belgium. But neurological re recovery sometimes can be only partial and sometimes it can be complete. But 93% of them tend to have some sort of a recovery in three months. And But unfortunately, relapse rates also can happen and it happens in 16% of the cases. This again comes from the case series. In where they have done a median follow-up of 12 months, where relapse has found to occur in 16%. This is from the same case series of the Belgian. And obviously, recovery is reduced or slower when there has been delay in establishing diagnosis or when there has been a delay in initiating treatment. Obviously, if you have not entertained this thought that possibly it could be Hashimoto's, so one would not have diagnosed and one would not have initiated on steroids. So the recovery also get protracted and delayed and sometimes refractory also. And these are the two case series which have showed that 25% of them, despite treatment with steroids, can have residual cognitive impairment. So cognitive impairment is something that one can expect to be present in 25% despite the treatment. And long-term immunosuppressive treatment may be needed in some cases who are refractory to steroid therapy. So, so that's about the prognostic value. So that's all it is in Hashimoto's encephalopathy. So the key summary message is in someone who has hypothyroidism or thyroid disorder uh, and who comes with encephalopathy in ICU, please do anti-TPO antibodies. If anti-TPO titers are more than 500 and they have had encephalopathy with seizures, when we say encephalopathy, it is three components. It is seizures and cognitive disorder and neuropsychiatric manifestations. So these three are the typically happens. And in the absence of any other sort of a differential diagnosis, uh, entertain this thought of Hashimoto's and start them on steroids. And if they don't respond to steroids, then you have to look at other autoimmune encephalitis that may be present and look at paraneoplasty. So those are the key messages that uh, possibly every intensivist can have in mind. And pathophysiologically, it is the same as any other ICU conditions. There is a lot of antibodies against the various neurons and some sort of a low-grade vasculitis that is happening, and endothelial dysfunction is there with inflammatory changes. So that's about it. So I request all of you to attend our signature conference, JICS, that's happening from 18th to 20th October. I can request all of you to submit valuable work to General of Acute Care. So thank you. Thank you, Vandu.